Hello, the title of this lecture is Creed and Canon. For a corporate body to grow, good leadership is, is essential. The rise of the church as an organization depended on the work of the apostles and others who followed, all under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The church refers to that visible body of professed believers. This lecture examines the early church and the emergence of key leaders and writers church organizations, and the importance of presenting proper theology supported by authoritative scripture. The three main expressions of early Christians were meetings early on the first day, Sunday, sharing a common meal that evolved into the Eucharist, and participating in baptism. Meeting and worshiping every Sunday was a commemoration of Christ's resurrection. For the first century, these meetings were primarily in private homes, usually owned by prominent men and women. Sharing a meal or breaking of bread allowed Christians to be closer with Jesus. The Christian community's act of breaking bread in remembrance of Christ was a way believers could connect to the past, Christ's Last Supper, and to the future, Christ's second coming. Participating in baptism was another key expression of Christianity. Baptism represented the new circumcision where sins were washed away with the rite of initiation, washing, and regeneration. Bapti baptism done on Easter further linked it to Jesus' resurrection. As the church community grew, there was the necessity of developing better organization under good leaders. It was the apostles who stepped into leadership. They had spent time with Jesus and witnessed his resurrection. They dispersed throughout the Roman Empire with Peter linked to Rome, John to Asia, and Thomas further to the east. Paul claimed to be an apostle due to having experienced the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. Paul's letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, became known as the pastoral epistles, which offered guidance for authoritative teaching about faith and order. For example, chapter 3 of 1 Timothy discusses the qualifications of church elders and deacons. From the original NIV translation, here are the first seven verses of chapter three. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Uh, please note that overseer is another word for elder. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, nor violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into devil's trap. Today, some Christian denominations do not have elders, and there are denominations that have both male deacons and female deaconesses. The early church stressed the importance of good and pious leaders who taught sound doctrine and warned of false teaching. At first, the highest rank in the local congregation was the office of the elder or presbyter. Later, there is the emergence of bishops. Initially, a bishop was pretty much synonymous with elder. In time, bishops took on additional responsibilities to what was standard for elders. 
The rise of bishops played an important role of organizing the Christian church. It was essential to maintain the authority and standards that the apostles had set. The task of the early bishops were to provide correct teaching, overseeing the baptism of new converts, and guarding against heresy. Although deacons had a subordinate position to bishops and elders, they faced the same rigid qualifications for the office that elders faced. In the year 90, John, the last of the original apostles, died. Filling the gap for guidance were key writers and defenders of the faith. By the second century, bishops gained greater status. Ignatius was an influential writer and the Bishop of Antioch. Ignatius provided proper teaching in the face of the doctrinal error taught by groups such as the Ebonites. The Ebonites rejected the virgin birth and saw Jesus as a great human prophet. Ignatius warned Christians to be on guard least quote, you fall prey to stupid ideas. He also wrote, quote, I urge you to be thoroughly convinced of the birth, passion, resurrection, which occurred when Pontius Pilate was governor. Ignatius was arrested and went on trial, but there's no record of the events. It appears that his martyrdom was a result of his opposition to heretical doctrines. Another important writer martyred was Justin Martyr. Justin was a native of Samaritan Palestine. As a Christian leader in Rome, he protested Roman injustice of executing Christians. For his confessions that he was a teacher of Christianity and for his refusal to offer incense to the Roman gods, he was beheaded. Justin Martyr was not a bishop, but he was one of the most significant apologists of the early Christian church. His writings tackled pagan criticism of Christianity. He countered the crude pagan claims that Christians were guilty of cannibalism and incest. He clarified that Christian worship was not secret rites involving magic or immoral immorality. By way of baptism, Christians made a solemn declaration of commitment and obedience to God. Christians gathered for Sunday worship that focused on a Eucharist taken as the flesh and blood of Jesus, who was the Savior of the world. Justin explained that Christians prayed together, read from the apostles and prophets, and took a collection for the poor, widows, and orphans. They also prayed for their enemies. They were not a threat to the Roman Empire. Justin linked the best insights of Greek philosophy and the beliefs of Christians, but he concluded that Christian theology was the true philosophy. He saw pagan mythology as an absurd superstition. A recent study on the early church by Ivor Davison explains Justin's thinking. Quote, the transcendent mysterious God spoken of by Platonist thinkers is the God of biblical revelation. This God was known throughout history by his divine word or logos in a matter reminiscent of the stoic idea that the logos is eminent in all reality. Not only is it the case that all people have a sense of God's existence, the light that they have is implanted by the Logos, for as the Stoics saw, seeds of the Logos are present throughout the world. For Justin, the Logos was present in the patriarchs, prophets, and philosophers, and it was this Logos that had become incarnate def definitely in Jesus Christ. Theologian Craig Carter writes, for, for Justin, Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament for prophecy 
was absolutely central to his understanding of the nature of the Christian faith and to his proclamation in the world. Justin's search for truth and wisdom resulted in writings that portrayed Christianity as a serious option for potential converts. In approximately 150 AD, Justin wrote his Apologia. This literature was written for a non-Christian audience and explains the salvation process. As many as are persuaded and believe that the things are true which are taught and said by us and promise that they are able to live accordingly, they are taught to pray and with fasting to ask God's forgiveness of their former sins while we pray and fast with them. Thereupon, they are brought by us to where there is water and are born again in the same manner of a new birth as we also ourselves were born again. For in the name of God, the Father and Lord of all, and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive the washings in the water. By explaining the important aspects of Christianity in a non-technical manner, Justin Martyr effectively communicated proper biblical teaching. The distinguished Bishop Arrhenius was another impressive writer and theologian of the early church. He was born in the church of Smyrna, Smyrna located on the Aegean coast of Anatolia. He traveled to Gaul and settled in Lyons, where he became a presbyter. Later, he became the bishops at Lyons. Arrhenius benefited from his belonging to both the East and the West. With his knowledge of Greek Christian thinking, he was influential. Combining the zeal of the evangelist with the skill of a master writer, he was more than a match for the Gnostics. And I'll say more about uh, Gnosticism shortly. Arrhenius focused less on philosophical speculation and more on the practice of guiding the Christian life of his followers. He had a grand vision of history where the union of man and God is the end goal and thus the focus must be on the incarnation and an individual path to greater communion with God. One key passage of Arrhenius writing articulates a Christian interpretation that is consistent and powerful. Arrhenius writes, Although the church is dispersed throughout the whole world to the very ends of the earth, it has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith in one God, the Father Almighty, who made the heaven and the earth and the seas and everything in them, and in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was made flesh for our salvation, and in the Holy Spirit, who proclaims through the prophets the times and adv advents and the birth from a virgin and the passion and the resurrection from the dead and the bodily accession into heaven of the beloved son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, and this future appearing from heaven in the glory of the Father to sum up all things and to raise up anew all flesh of the human race. Arena's theology was remarkable. It contained a rich synthesis of scripture and tradition. Given his presentation of a clear Trinitarian concept of God, he is one of the greatest early Christian thinkers. As the role of the bishop increased, so did the bond of unity in the church and the development of a creed. Essentially, and um, uh, it, sorry, indeed, an essential component is the stabilization of the of the early church was the emergence of creeds. Creeds are short statements that inspired believers and educated non-believers of Christian think of Christian teaching. 
before the arrival of the conciliar creeds, there were the baptismal creeds. Baptismal creeds, reflecting its name, provided instructions for Christian converts. They became important documents in guarding church teaching against false teaching, against heresy. In addition to being the most recognizable, the Apostles' Creed is the oldest summary of the essential doctrines of Scripture. This is an earlier version. I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day, he rose again from the dead ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Although the Apostles' Creed did not reach its final version until the 8th century, Earlier versions were used widely in Western churches for several centuries. It first took shape in Rome near the year 150, and the one that appeared in the year 340 was un unmistakably Trinitarian. As one church historian explains, it gives attention to the person and work of each of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit. It emphasizes the universal nature of the corporate church and linking salvation with Christ has an explicit eschatology centering in the resurrection of the believer and their goal of eternal life. The Apostles' Creed clarified the falseness of Gnosticism. There is some difficulty in precisely defining Gnosticism. One historian points out that Gnosticism is a, quote, phenomenon that appears in such different guises and in such diverse places that some despair about even defining it. Broadly speaking, the Gnostics saw God as a deity of pure spirit and the material world as not ultimately real. The physical world was an obstacle to be more or less set aside. Gnosticism, Gnosticism posited two gods, the evil one of the Old Testament to create and the good one to redeem. Perhaps the best understood as a synthesis of Christianity and Hellenistic philosophy, Gnosticism was a way to explain the origin of evil. Because the Gnostics associated matter with evil, they attempted to, quote, create a philosophical system in which God as spirit could be freed from association with evil and in which man could be related on the spiritual side of his nature to deity. The Gnostics believed the chosen few had a spark of the divine that allowed them to understand the ways of God while avoiding what seemed to them to be as the stigma of the cross. One historian, one historian summarizes Gnosticism, uh, re quote, rejected the reality of the humanity, sacrificial death, and physical resurrection of Christ. Writers over the centuries recognized the threat of Gnostic thinking. One early 20th century church historian wrote, Gnosticism was an immense peril for the church. It cut out the historic foundation of Christianity. 
its God is not the God of the Old Testament, which is the work of an inferior or even evil being. Its Christ had no real incarnation, death, or resurrection. Its salvation is for the few capable of spiritual enlightenment. The peril was the was gri was greater because Gnosticism was represented by some of the keenest minds in the church of the second century. There were gifted thinkers and writers who chose this heresy, who went down this false road, and countering their influence was paramount for the early Christian thinkers upholding a biblical orthodox view. Linked to Gnosticism, uh, Marcion in the second century introduced troubling ideas. The son of a bishop, Marcion was raised in a Christian family. He became a wealthy man who began teaching his distinctive views, including the idea that the church had obscured the gospel by seeking to combine it with Judaism. Marcion's God was a God of love. The God of the Old Testament was an evil God. The point that God is love is correct, but lost for Marcion was the important component of God as judge. Marcion wanted scripture without any of Jesus' reference to the Old Testament. Marcion's heretical ideas resulted in his excommunication. His next step was to gather his followers in separate, separated churches. But in these churches, husbands and wives could not have sexual union with each other. They were to be separated and live celibate. Marcion's movement was dangerous because it formed churches that broke Christianity from its historic background as completely as had the more speculative Gnostic theories. In Marcion's teaching, there was no real incarnation. Essential was the common condemnation of the Old Testament and its God. One reason his ideas persisted for centuries, particularly in the eastern part of the empire, was that they appealed to those who opposed legalism. The Apostles' Creed also refuted docetic heresies. Originating from the Greek word meaning to seem, docetism, claimed that Christ only seemed to take on flesh. He only appeared to interact physically with the world. Christ was a purely spiritual being without any con uh, contamination from a material body. Thus, docetics denied the reality of Christ's material body. It was only a phantom that was crucified. To expose such heresies, Orthodox church leaders used the Apostles' Creed. The word canon originally referred to a rod or ruler as a measuring device. From this, we look to canon as representing a standard. In the fourth, fourth, mid fourth century, the church began to use the word canon as referring to the, quote, the authoritative list of the books in the Bible. Certainly, the development of the New Testament canon was key for Christians desiring a theological standard and wanting the theological stability for ch Christian churches. It took over two centuries for the process to unfold. After much prayer and brain work, the canon took shape without any place for heretical works. By the end of the fourth century, the New Testament comprised of 27 books. 
For the church to ward off false teaching, it was fundamental to develop the list of books that should comprise the New Testament. Heretics such as Marcion were setting up their own canon of scripture and were leading people astray. In persecution, the early Christians were not willing to risk their lives for a book unless they were sure it was an integral part of the canon of scripture. As the early Christian church grew, good leadership was essential. The work of the apostles guided by the Holy Spirit gave the church a wonderful foundation of biblical truth. The gifted and pious writers that followed were needed to ward off the many heresies of various false teachers. It was essential to clarify that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Justo Gonzalez writes, Jesus is the second Adam because in his life, death, and resurrection, a new humanity had been created. And, and in all his actions, Jesus has corrected what was twisted because of sin. End of quote. In other words, Jesus defeated Satan, which allows humans to live in freedom. The Apostles' Creed and the emergence of the canon presented truth for the holy men and women living and serving Christ in an age where there was considerable hostility towards Christianity and biblical truth that exposed the darkness of worldly thinking. Thank you.